Some of them may have definitely been written by David, and some of them are attributed to David. This isn't too different from today in our own time. I, I've read books by uh, James Patterson. Has anyone read James Patterson? Have you noticed that now there's like these other names underneath? James Patterson, great title with Maxine Pareto. And we don't know who wrote how much of each book, but it's still a good book with James Patterson's name. That's kind of what it is when we look at the Psalms that are attributed to David. It's not so important who wrote how much of it, but it is a good lesson and a good text for us to study. And this leads us into our specific text today, Psalms 91, 1 to 6. It's one of the 34 Psalms that doesn't have an author title attribute. So we don't know who wrote it. If you want to look and follow along, we're going to start with verse 1 and break it down as we go through. Verse 1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I mean, what a wonderful image. Dwelling in a shelter made and blessed by God. I mean, what would that be like? I mean, perhaps you live in a home that has been prayed over or blessed by God. Could be even more than that. What about resting in the shadow of God? I mean, here as we try to close out summer, we have a great idea of what it's like to be in heat. The heat of summer. The steam rising up off the, the street. The sweat coming down. Humidity and hot. And then imagine in the midst of all that heat, you feel the cool shadow of the Lord come up for you on protection. Maybe even a cool breeze. Maybe a shiver down your neck as you shift from hot to cool shadow of the Lord. Verse 2 continues to describe this situation. It says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. How is it that God is our, ref our refuge? You know, as I thought about this, I thought, I think there's a lot of scriptures that relate to this. So I went to that great source, Google, and said, show me other scriptures. That relate to refuge. And it pointed out Psalms 46 7, and this is from the King James Bible. It says, The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Another Psalm 46 1, again from King James, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You know, from these scriptures, I can see that God is with us always. In all ways, even as God was with Jacob. That story comes from Genesis 28.10. God appears to Jacob in a dream and promises to take care of him on his journey. And God does. When we read that, we can see it's a good example of God being one's refuge and strength in time of trouble. Verse 3 continues to explain how God saves us from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. You know, when we read scripture, it sometimes helps us to put ourselves in the place at the time of where the scripture was written and for the people it was written to. So if you can imagine what it was like during the time of the psalmist and imagine someone setting snares for birds, the fowler's snare as a means of trapping one's food for the next day. I can kind of relate to that. Visualize that. What about deadly pestilence or disease? During that time, imagine not knowing where the disease came from or what a cure or treatment that we might have today, but yet praying <coughs> and receiving God's refuge from disease and pestilence. You know, here. In these first three verses we've looked at of our text today, we have various ways in which God cares for us and saves us and protects us. But how do we know that? How do we know personally in our heart and in our mind that God will and does indeed take care of us? How do we know that just because 
because it happened in the Bible, it might happen to me. As I reflected on that, I think the four areas that I can turn to that might help me feel a sense of comfort and reassurance that I can trust this. The first is Scripture, where we seek to discover the Word of God through reading, through prayer, and discussion with one another, where we make meaning of the Word in our lives. And through the Bible, we use Scripture to help make sense of this. It's our roadmap to how we might live, a source of encouragement, even a place to find lament when our words are not enough to express the pain and sorrow that we may feel. Through Scripture, we encounter the divine, the holy of holies, God Almighty, and the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. The second area that I look to the for this would be tradition. It's the wisdom of those Christians, those theologians, those practitioners, people who have come before you and I from across the globe. Maybe even here in our own midst or in our home. It could come from formal teachings of Sunday school and Bible study to the songs that we sing and commit to memory the ones we whistle or sing along in the car or as we walk down the street could come from vacation Bible school or more. But out of that tradition and out of our past that we've learned, we can trust that God is delivering us from our refuge into refuge. The third is our ability to reason, to make sense of the word in our world. Making use of our God-given talent to think with our minds and feel with our hearts. This is when we become aware of different readings of Scripture. How one of us will see one lesson in the Scripture, and another one will see a completely different lesson. And it's our ability to converse on those, and our ability to mature in our faith over time as we study and grow as one in the body of Christ. And then the fourth way is just personal experience. If you've ever been coached or mentored on how to share Christ with another person, you know the personal story is by far the best and most powerful witness that you can share with another. And nothing helps another understand the power than hearing our own story and how God has provided refuge for us. How God has saved us from sin and sorrow through His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, this is how we live out God in our life when we share with another. It's where the text becomes alive in our lives. Where our own individual experience becomes validated by sharing with another believer and reflecting on how God is present in our lives. There are a few other scriptures. Okay, there's a lot of other scriptures where God saves someone in the Bible from the fowler's snare or deadly pestilence. If you have your Bible or a Bible app, please look these up as we go along if you like. You might just want to make a note if you're taking notes. Or you might just want to close your eyes and listen to the scriptures and let God's words fall over you. Here's a few scriptures speaking to God's refuge. Psalms 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and the Lord answered me. The Lord delivered me from all my fears. Psalms 34, 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. The Lord delivers them from all their troubles. Psalm 107, 6. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and the Lord delivered them from their distress. John 8, 32. This is from the King James Version. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 15, 7. If you abide in me, words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
Now, each of these scriptures speaks to God as our refuge, our deliverer, one worthy of abiding in, a source of strength, our almighty God. Verse 4 of the text today says, He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. There's that word again, refuge. And his faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You know, I can imagine a, a mother hen or a hawk you know, putting the wing around a little one, or maybe it's even the male of the species doing the protecting from the dangers of the word world, spreading its wings over the offspring. Can you recall a time when someone wrapped their arms around you in a hug of reassurance and love? I mean, if that's how good it feels when a human does that to you, what do you think how great it'll feel when God does that to us in the heavens? Or maybe you've already felt it from God now in the Holy Spirit wrapping loving arms around you. Just like the feathers finding refuge under the wings. Verse 5 and 6 says, You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the error that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Neither shall we fear a day in day or night. Again, I'm looking for verses in the Bible that, that concur with this, that may say it just a little different way that really helps us understand this text for today or gives us the encouragement we need each day. Isaiah 41, 43, 1 says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I've summoned you by name. You are mine. I mean, that to me, that's just like that. I summon you, and I put my wing of protection around you. Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am with you. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Second Timothy says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Man, I really like that one, especially when we're in a world today where so many reports come in of disaster and people acting out their, their hurt and it's related to their mental condition or emotional state or spiritual weakness or pain that they're having. And I look to God for answers like I'm sure you do. And here in the scripture, it speaks specifically to power and love and sound mind from God and the Holy Spirit. First Peter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he hath cared for you. Casting your care, I love that idea. It's just kind of like taking this, casting your care upon the Lord. Let it go. Surrender your worries, your fears, and God will provide. God does provide. God provided in the past. God provides in the current, and God will provide in the future. God is indeed available to each of us as a refuge, a safe haven, a source of grace and love and forgiveness. We've referenced many scriptures today. There's going to be a test later, maybe a trivia game tonight in the local place. There won't be. <laughs> Yet, how do we experience the refuge of God? What is it for us in our personal life? How do we reason with this scripture and bring it home and make it our own? You know, as I, as I prepared the sermon for today, I thought of two ways or two areas in our lives where we can really experience the refuge of God. Now, if we had some time to explore this, we could probably come up with a hundred different ways or areas, but I thought these two might help us really bring it home. The first
first one is in our relationship with others. I mean, being with other, others can bring out the greatest of joy and ecstasy, or it can create the most stressful times in our lives. And it's like one preacher said, I love the members of my church. Yet yeah, church would be so much more pe peaceful without the people. <laughs> I wonder what that's what the author had in mind when they penned. It was the best of times and the worst of times. Or as Robin Mead says on CNN, we people, we're funny. We're weird. We're kind of crazy. On one hand, we, we experience the love and joy of one another. And on the other hand, it's sometimes our most difficult task. It's a conundrum of life. How to get along in peace with love and grace towards one another. I'm convinced that we can only do this. I can only do this with the help of God. I have yet to find anything else that really is a lasting solution when it comes to getting along with others. God created humans to be in relationship with God and one another. And it's often through our relationship with others that we learn about our relationship with God. Think about a marriage relationship as one human plus another human plus God come together. This triad can exist in other relationships with children. Maybe even a business partner or a nonprofit relationship where you invite God into the mix to be a part of the relationship and work through both the good and the difficult situations. And it's in the midst of working out our relationship with humans that we find out things about ourselves and God and about God and the other person. And see God as our refuge, our strength, and guidance. How many of you have utter, ever uttered the simple words, God help me? Anyone? <laughs> that simple prayer recalls to your mind, probably like mine, Alan, I can imagine you in a council meeting, quietly to yourself, as something is uttered that seems crazy and out of sync with society, and he goes, God help me, or God help us all. We've all been there. Those three little words, though, invite God into the situation and into the relationship. And God can and does show us a way to refuge. So besides relationship, if you want another area to look at where you will see God providing refuge, think about money and financial resources. You know, financial means and money is just, it's really a way of keeping score in our society. Who's got the most? Who's short? Who's in need? And of course, Scripture word, war, warns us about putting too much emphasis. You know, the love of of money can be the root of evil. But you know, both this church, as beautiful as it is, and our church across the way, it takes money to take care of this beautiful facility. And we have pride in our traditions that it comes with upkeep and maintenance of the buildings. Gutters need repair. Steeples need to be straightened and helped. Air conditioners break down. Maintenance must be done. And I don't know about you, but it's hard to have a fundraiser around the words of, come maintain a building with us. Not too many people want to get into that. You know, what did you give to on giving day? I gave to maintain an old building. Just doesn't seem to have the glitz and glamour to save the children or other worthy needs. You know, but with all these issues we have with the old structure, and we're not going old city buildings, old museums, any kind of structure that you look at and go, wow, how beautiful and old that is, comes with the same issues. Thank God we have God on our side because God always provides what we need, not always what we want. For example, over at the Methodist Church, after a period of not using our sanctuary for over a year, we began to get ready to move back in there and have some activities. We got our leaks fixed, everything's good. We turned on the air conditioning, it worked for a couple of days, and then it died. Our great trustee, Mr. Lou Valero, 
gets with a couple of air conditioner repair people and they both say the same thing. You've got major repair or replacement issues. You better plan to spend $30,000 or more dollars. And we just were getting ready to do some other renovations. We hope to have a little money to do that. You mean instead of planning on a nice garden area, we're going to have to replace the air conditions? I mean, that just wasn't too cool. So I took that information and sent it to our architect team and said, will you put this in so we can prioritize the other things we're doing? We'll get air conditioning repaired. They sent a referral to us. And I got a call and said, uh, we were referred to you by your architect. We'd like to come out and take a look. Salesperson and the technician showed up and spent over an hour diagnosing and working on our system. And as Lou Valero and I sat and stood over in the courtyard while the two people looked at the air conditioning unit, I asked Lou, would you like to know what I'm praying for? I'm praying that nothing is wrong and it works just fine. Now, I don't know where the prayer come from. I hadn't said it before. It came to me in the moment. I simply shared it with Lou. But about a half hour later, they came to us and said, you're not out of Freon. It's working. And it's cooling the building. Yeah, you're going to need a little work. Yes, it's an old system. You're eventually going to have to do more work. But right now, you might need about $3,000 worth of maintenance and upkeep done. Now, I don't know how that happened. I don't know if the first two were just, first two air conditioning companies were just kind of quick in a hurry and decided, this thing's so old, let's just tell them to buy a new one. We don't have time to mess with this. Or it could be that God intervened and God is our refuge. I'll let you decide. I can tell you which one I believe. That God is active and present in our lives and just like we read miracles in the Bible, they happen every day in our individual lives too. Sometimes it's simple as you get a little answer to prayer that you want, and sometimes it's as big as an air conditioner. So money tends to be a way in which we keep track of our earthly means. Time is another. We view money and time as limited resources and try to keep track of who's got more and where you spend it in our human existence. But as in our air conditioning example, God intervenes. And so often what we intend for one thing, God takes and does something else with much greater. As I bring the sermon to a close, yes, we're going to land this thing. I ask that you look at the verses for today. Everyone pull out their bulletin. There's one there that says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and whom I trust. Would you please join me and let's say that out loud. I will I'll say of the Lord, Lord he, he is my refuge, my and fortress, fortress, my God, and whom I trust. trust. As we leave this place today, perhaps that verse will go with us. Maybe you can clip it out, put it on your dashboard or refrigerator or Stick it in your Bible for later reflection. And use it to remember some of the things we've talked about today, some of the scriptures you've heard, the songs we've seen, or maybe just a conversation that you have had or will have. But God is active and present in our life and a refuge for us every day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.